You're listening to the VSL Aviation Podcast. I'm your host, Seth Blake, and this is episode eight. Thank you for listening. And if you're watching on YouTube, thanks for watching. Uh, This is kind of right now uh, a dual podcast slash YouTube channel, I guess. Um, Some of the shows, I'll just have time to make a podcast. They're a little bit easier to edit, but I do like the visual format and people like the videos. So I'm going to continue making the videos as well. Uh, For those of you listening on the podcast, I'll do my best to make the content uh, basically accessible through just audio, so I'm not going to use a lot of visuals, but uh, I will be going through some visuals, so if you have a a chance to check out the YouTube channel, that'd be great as well. Uh, In today's episode, we're going to get into the Instrument Airman Certification Standards. The Instrument Airman Certification Standards, or the Instrument ACS, is the rubric which DPEs like myself use to give the instrument checkride. So uh, we'll, we'll call it the checkride. It's actually called a practical test. But anyway, the, the ACS lists each event that we have to do, including the questions that we have to ask during the oral par- portion of the checkride or the ground portion of the checkride, and then all of the maneuvers that we have to do and the standards to which you have to perform them. So in episodes one uh, through four, I go through the private pilot ACS. So I go into detail how the ACS actually works there. But just as a recap, since this is episode one of our instrument, the way the ACS works is, uh, and I'm going to pull it up right here on my laptop. We're looking at um, area of operation one, which is pre-flight preparation. And so the ACS is divided into several different areas of operation. Within each area of operation, you have tasks, and the tasks are labeled task A, B, C, uh, like that. So area of operation one is pre-flight preparation, and it has three tasks, A, A through C. Uh, and, and these are the tasks that we're typically going to complete during the oral examination. Uh, so I, I'm looking at the first task of the instrument ACS, and it's a uh, task A, pilot qualifications. Uh, and, it, and there's a bunch of lines. It looks kind of like a, a table uh, or a graph of some sort. So it's a table with two columns. On the left-hand column, you have the labels. And there's some coded words, uh, or it's it broken down into knowledge, risk management, and skills. And there's codes beneath each of those labels that are labeled, for instance, ir.i.a.k1. So that's kind of, uh, that's the code for the line of knowledge, which is certification requirements, recency of experience, and record keeping. So that is just a abbreviated way to say you need to have knowledge as an applicant on those things that I just said. Uh, Now these reference back to the written exam tests that you took on your instrument written exam. So if you were to miss the question related to uh, certification requirements, you would have uh, an error code on your test report that would be labeled IRAK1. And when you hand that to your DPE, that lets me as a DPE know exactly what questions you missed And I I then have to incorporate those missed questions into the checkride. And I do that through my plan of action. So that's how the the codes work in the ACS. Now, we we have uh, knowledge, risk management, and skill areas there on the ACS. Uh, During the checkride, you have to perform all of the skills. Uh, So in area of operation uh, one, Uh, Task A, there's only one skill, skill S1, and that's to apply requirements to act as PIC under instrument flight rules in a scenario given by the evaluator. That's the only skill that that you have to demonstrate as the applicant. In addition to demonstrating the skills, you have, or I have to sample one of, at least one of the risk management areas and at least one of the knowledge areas. Now, if you missed a question on the knowledge test and it's in that subsequent task, then that's the task or you know that I'm going to ask a question related to that. So right now, if you've taken your instrument written and you're you're thinking about going and taking your uh, instrument check right here pretty soon and you're wondering what kind of questions the DP is going to ask you during the oral, well, look at your test sheet because all the questions that you missed on the test, you know hundred percent they're going to ask questions about that and that's dictated by the 8900.1 uh, which is the what we use as an examiners and basically a rule book that says we have to design a plan of action tailored for you the applicant that takes into account all the questions that you missed on that written exam 
Uh, now, if you didn't miss any uh, questions in uh, pilot qualification, um, so in that K1, K2, K3, if you didn't miss any of those on the written, then I'm just going to pick one at random. Uh, and I have kind of the standard ones that I go through. And that's kind of what, what I'm going to do during this podcast is kind of go through how I would conduct an oral exam for just an instrument pilot to say that they didn't miss any particular questions. Uh, this is just how I would do it uh, in, in a normal instrument check ride scenario. So uh, the first thing that you need to know about the check ride is uh, the FAA really likes scenario-based check rides, and, and they ask us examiners to uh, basically develop a scenario and, and give the check ride based around that scenario. And so what I mean by a scenario is something like, let's say uh, I, you contact me about a check ride about a week in advance and say, I'd like to take my instrument check ride. I get you booked and I say, okay, prepare to fly a uh, uh, instrument cross country from Russellville, that's where we're at right now, to Destin, Florida. And that's, that's what I tell you to do. So you're going to plan a cross country from Russellville, Arkansas to Destin, Florida. And you're going to bring me, we're going to go to a wedding down there, and we're going to come back after dark. So that's kind of the, the rough scenario. You have the day of the flight that's going to take place. You know, um, the basic mission is that we're going to go to a wedding. Uh, and I might give you some weights as far as luggage and myself. Um, so, so that's the basic scenario. So when you come in to uh, do the check ride, after we do the administrative stuff and qualify you for the check ride, uh, I'm going to give you a pre-test briefing. Uh, then you're going to sign the application, and we're going to get started on task A, which is pilot qualifications. So what I would say is, all right, so we're you're going to fly me IFR to Destin, Florida. So before we even get to the airplane, um, what you know, what all qualifications do you have to have in order to act as a pilot in command of uh, an an instrument flight rules flight from here to Destin? And that is basically exactly what S1, skill S1, requires, is apply requirements to act as PIC under IFR by a given scenario as evaluator. So I just asked that question. So if you're wondering what kind of questions you're going to get asked during the oral of your instrument check ride or any other check ride for that matter, start by looking at the skills section of the ACS. So the pilot qualifications, skill one, you know exactly the examiner is going to ask either that question exactly or something very close to that question in regards to the scenario. So uh, the answers that I'm looking for here, obviously you've got the, the obvious ones, which is, okay, I need a valid government photo ID, uh, I need my medical, and I need my pilot certificate. Those are the documents that qualify me, right? I uh, also need to have a current flight review. So in the past... Uh, 24 calendar months, I need to have completed either some sort of practical test with the FAA or some sort of flight review activity with an instructor. Uh, if I'm going to be flying with passengers, I'll need to conduct three takeoffs and landings. Uh, if it's going to be at night, those need to be to a full stop in the same uh, category and class of aircraft. So if it's a single engine aircraft, single engine. If it's a multi, it needs to be in a multi. Uh, and then in addition to that, here's where we're getting to the meat of the subject for the instrument check ride, is you need these additional six instrument approaches. You need holding procedures and tasks uh, and intercepting and tracking courses. And you need to have completed those in the previous six months. So that's the additional stuff that you need to be qualified to act as PIC of an IFR flight. So it, we can look at kind of the knowledge areas of this task as well as the risk management areas to figure out what other kinds of questions uh, a DPE might ask. So let's start with the knowledge. So certification requirements, experience, and record keeping. I might ask you, well, what's your plan? How do you know that you've accomplished these six approaches in the past six months? And I might even ask you as the applicant to, okay, well, you just obviously have been doing a lot of instrument training uh, why don't you go in your logbook real quick for me and find the past six instrument approaches you've done and give me the date of the latest one, so the sixth one or the first one in the past of six instrument approaches. Uh, that's going to drive the question of if you're on an electronic flight book or electronic logbook, that is, that's really easy for you to pull up that information, incredibly easy to do that. If you're on a paper logbook and you don't have some sort of Excel tracker or some sort of uh, way to, to track 
your your records as far as when you did an instrument approach, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to pull up that information. And that's just going to drive home the conversation of, all right, I understand that you've been training, you've been focused on learning how to fly instruments, but leaving this check right, I want you to also learn some stuff. And maybe one of the things I want you to learn is that record keeping as an instrument pilot becomes a little more difficult than just tracking three takeoffs and landings in the previous 90 days. An electronic logbook really helps with that. So that may be one of the questions. Uh, privileges and limitations. I may ask you in some sort of way, you know, what if I wanted to pay you as the uh, passenger that's, that's flying you? What if I wanted to pay you for this flight? Is that something that you're allowed to do as a private pilot? And of course, the answer is uh, you can accept the pro rata share uh, for that flight, but you need to be paying at least the pro rata share of the flight, if not more. So you could pay for the whole flight, uh, but you, you can't accept for, you know, more than or less than you can't pay less than the pro rata share. Uh, and where a scenario, a great scenario is a lot of the um, uh, charity organizations. Um, so Angel Flight, for instance, I think they require you to have your instrument rating. So that's a great way for you to give back to the community and help people out. And that looks, you know, that may look like, well, that's kind of like a charter operation, right? They pick up the phone, they say they need to go somewhere, and you fly them there. Well, the key difference is that you, the pilot, are paying for all of the expenses to dispatch that flight. So we're not worried about pro rata. You're paying all of it, right? You're not just paying a portion of it. You're paying for the plane, the fuel, everything, and you're taking this person that's in need to get to, to uh, health care somewhere, you're paying to take them there out of your own pocket. So that's fine. But accepting uh, money from that person for them to fly, then we start getting into the kind of the commercial area. I don't actually spend a lot of time talking about that on the instrument check ride. I tend to focus on just instrument stuff, but that, that could come up. That'll definitely come up in your commercial check ride. Uh, and we'll talk about the commercial ACS here in a few weeks. Uh, part 68, um, our basic med privileges and limitations. If you qualify with basic med, expect to get some questions on that. Now we get into the risk management area. Here's where I can get a lot of questions out of these statements in the risk management area. So failure to distinguish proficiency versus currency. So that's, that's huge, right? Because we talk about it in three takeoffs and landings in the previous 90 days, you're current, but are you safe? Right. Some people, a lot of people, in fact, are going to need more than three takeoffs and landings in the previous 90 days and a flight review every two years to be a safe pilot. Um, you're just going to need more time than that. And so that's the difference between proficiency and currency is safety. Um, how many approaches do you need in order to feel safe shooting that approach in IMC conditions? Uh, and are you going to shoot it down to minimums? Is that your is that your minimum altitude is minimums? Or have you thought about personal minimums? Um, have you thought about a, uh, a deliberate way to stay proficient? Have you thought about the FAA wings program? Have you thought about uh, working with your double I and having a plan in place before you get your instrument rating saying, all right, once I get my instrument rating, we're still going to meet um, for the first six months, and, and we're going to fly at least one approach a month, and we're going to do everything we can to go out and take advantage of safe, actual IMC conditions. Whenever they appear, I'm going to give you a call, and I want to go up and get as much actual time as possible. Uh, so have there's some sort of, it can be an informal plan for proficiency, but have a plan for proficiency and don't just try to make it up. Um, all right, the other stuff I could talk about. Let's see. Failure to establish or set personal minimums. So if you haven't thought about personal minimums, that could be something uh, that might drive some more questions from me um, saying, well, you know, minimums are pretty low. An ILS, a lot of times is bringing you 200 feet above the ground. Uh, and I know the airlines, part 135 and 121, until you have 100 hours in an aircraft, they're going to they're gonna say, hey, you're going to actually add uh, buffers to your minimums before we'll let you fly that. And we're talking about maybe an, even an ATP level pilot is, is having those minimums or those kind of personal minimums, um, forced upon them. So you need to be disciplined enough as a private pilot and say, all right, I'm going to add a little bit to, uh, these minimums. Uh, one thing that I use that, that I, I think is a great tool is just say circling minimums. So until you have, let's say a hundred hours of simulated, uh, or actual instrument time, just limit yourself to, to circling minimums. Say, so I'm, I'm not going to fly unless I can shoot that approach 
and break out uh, at or above circling minimums. That's a good one, and it's not it's not incredibly restrictive. Uh, the reason I like circling minimums versus just saying, well, I'm going to add 200 feet is you have airports um, like in Colorado that might have extremely high circling minimums, well above, you know, 200 feet uh, above the lowest uh, minimums, or it, circling may not even be a factor. So if if uh, you look up an approach and circling min minimums aren't even published, well, that might drive you to say, well, why aren't circling minimums published? Uh, let me dig into this more, and there might be significant terrain around, and that might uh, force you to, to make different plans instead of flying in the air IFR. That's just an example. Uh, and then failure to ensure fitness uh, for flight and physiological factors uh, that might affect the pilot's ability to fly under instrument conditions. So that's a risk management. That's the third risk management item. So uh, the I am safe checklist, that's kind of what comes to mind. I'm sure you all are all thinking that already. But how does it different? Uh, how is the I am safe checklist different for instrument conditions than VFR conditions? Uh, and the answer is, you know, the, the instrument flying is is more of a mental game, right? We have the we have the monkey skills, right? The stick and rudder skills going on, uh, the same kind of skills that we have in VFR flying. Uh, maybe we want to be a little more fine tuned, uh, but that's one thing. The other thing is we're having to do all of that as well as make these complex analysis of instrument approaches and decisions on uh, minimums, and we're, we're going to have to analyze the, the notes there and the departure procedures, and we're always having to think ahead of the aircraft. aircraft. And by the way, ATC is, is now taking a toll uh, because they're, they're kind of sucking away our situational awareness every time they talk to us on the radio. That's brain cells we have to devote to talking on the radio instead of doing the, the regular stick and rudder skills. So you have all of these competing interests going on, and if you're if you're not well rested, uh, if you're distracted, uh, let's say you're you're flying to uh, a wedding or something, some sort of big life event, um, and you have your mind kind of elsewhere, and you're not really focused on flying the plane instrument uh, in instrument conditions, that can be a big factor. So, uh, if you do some sort of deliberate uh, risk analysis or, or flight risk assessment tool before you fly, which I advocate that you do. Uh, but if you do that, you may have a different, um, you may have a higher threshold for VFR flying than you do instrument flying. And, and what I'm trying to say there is you may, um, let, let's say you're on a scale of 1 to 10 for your I am safe checklist. 10 being I'm absolutely not going to fly. That's dangerous. And 1 being, hey, I'm totally good. I got eight hours of rest. I'm, I've eaten. I uh, don't have any ma major life stresses. I'm good to go. Nothing to worry about. Uh, with instrument flying, you might say, well, I need to be like a one through three in order for me to go. If I'm like a four, I'm definitely not going to go. Uh, but for your VFR flying, if you're just going to go up and, and fly a VFR pattern, I might accept a, a four or five. Um, and again, risk management is an incredibly personal thing, so you have to sit down with an instructor and talk about that. Uh, but that's just an example there. Uh, okay, some other notes that I've taken here. Um, these are kind of common errors that I see in check rides is actual versus uh, simulated. So knowing the difference between when I can log actual conditions and when I have to log simulated conditions. And then when a safety pilot comes in. So, of course, actual means, hey, I, I have no distinguishable horizon. I'm flying sole reference to the instruments. I'm going to log actual time in those conditions. If I'm going to log simulated conditions, I have to have a safety pilot on board, right? I can't log simulated instrument time solo. You just can't. You're either actual or you're VFR. There's no way to log simulated instrument when you're by yourself. Uh, now, if a safety pilot is on board and I'm going to log that time as simulated instrument flight time, that safety pilot's name, that needs to be logged in my logbook. I need to have the name of the safety pilot. And really, uh, especially here's where a digital logbook comes in handy because you're not really limited to the amount that you can write in there. In the notes section, I would I would save their pilot certificate number, uh, you know, their phone number, email, all that stuff. So if my logbook is ever audited, it's easy to see, hey, this is the safety pilot. Here's how I can contact them. You can come come back and cross-reference that and prove, yes, I did that that simulated instrument time with, with Joe Bob pilot over there. 
Uh, and that's something that gets missed sometimes is knowing that you need to log the name there. Um, how do you plan and track this? That's a, a question that I have for everybody is, all right, you're going to go out, you're in your qualifying, you know, your initial six months and you want to say, Hey, I want to go do this approach and log it towards my currency. So I don't get behind. And let's say you, you put a personal minimum you're going to do, or part of your proficiency plan is you're going to do two approaches a month. Well, if you do two approaches a month, you'll never have to have an IPC. Uh, but chances are, in order for you to log two approaches a month, you're going to have to have a safety pilot involved. So how is that getting logged? Uh, do you have some sort of tracker? You know, obviously it needs to go in your logbook, but then how are you going to remember, hey, I did this this approach on this date, and that extends my currency forward. So having some sort of an Excel tracker, that would be great. Um, what does proficiency mean? How do you accomplish it? We already kind of talked about that. Um, you, the WINGS program is a great avenue for you to maintain proficiency. There's a lot of courses and seminars and webinars on there that are instrument focused. So I would encourage everybody listening to this podcast to go fasafety.gov, uh, build an account. If you don't know how to build a WINGS account, you can go to my YouTube page. I did a video on how to build a WINGS account where I went through uh, all the steps and I built kind of a fake account. So you can follow that step by step and it shows you exactly how to set that up. It also goes through on how you can request credit as a student or how you can give credit as an instructor. Uh, and so there's some great resources on there for proficiency. Um, all right, so WINGS courses, seminars, activities, we talked about that. Uh, what are your current personal minimums and when do they change or when will they change? Uh, that's a question I like to ask because uh, more than likely your personal minimums are they're kind of a living document. Um, they're not going to stay stagnant. So they might be one thing today, uh, and then two years from now, when you're a, a much more uh, practiced instrument pilot, your your personal minimums may change. So you need to think about those times where your your personal minimums are going to increase or decrease, um, and and that would become part of your personal minimums plan. So let's say if you don't fly, if you haven't done an instrument approach in the past 90 days, but you're still current, you may say, I'm not going to fly an instrument approach unless I have at least 3,000 foot ceilings or unless I'll break out prior to the final approach fix, uh, something to that effect. So be, you know, the more uh, formal your personal minimums are, I guess, the better they are. And the more time you spend writing those down, um, the, the FAA has a risk management handbook um, I need to put that in the show notes, but the, the risk management handbook um, from the FAA has a, a way to develop your personal minimums in the back of that handbook that's actually pretty good. Uh, and then do you have an accountability pilot? That's something that I've, that I've thought about recently of, uh, you know, thinking about myself. How I have pilots that, that I trust, that if I'm facing a challenging flight, uh, or a flight that might have a little more stacked against it than a normal flight, somebody that I call and, and say, hey, how would you handle this? Or is there anything that I'm missing? Um, should I look at maybe doing this another day? Or is this something that you think I can overcome? Um, sometimes those accountability pilots are very formal in aviation. So, for instance, a director of operations or chief pilot for Part 135, those are kind of formal accountability pilots. Um, a... Uh, uh, a supervisor of flying in the military. That's kind of a formal way of saying, hey, I'm, I'm your accountability. Before you walk out that door, I'm going to ask you, hey, Seth, do you have a plan to handle the this convective sigmet that's going to be developing and a line of storms that's coming in? How, what's your plan to mitigate those risks? And of course, in general aviation, we're not as mission-oriented, so none of these missions really have to occur. Uh, but still, I'm, I'm a big advocate for managing those risks and not just avoiding them altogether. So figuring out a way for you to do it safely, I think, is a better initial action than just saying, well, I'm going to cancel the flight and drive. Uh, that's, of course, that's, that's an option most of the time or all the time. Uh, but it, it maybe shouldn't be your first course of action to just cancel and drive. The first course of action would, okay, let me seek counsel. Maybe I can find a, a pilot to fly with me, and that would be a great way for me to develop as an airman is to go on this challenging mission that I wouldn't do by myself, but I'm going to bring my instructor along or I'm going to bring this other more experienced pilot along, and together we can handle it um, without any issues, and I'm going to learn a lot in the process of doing that. Uh, and then 
I put in here the information for operators, the info 15012. Uh, and the reason I put this in the notes is um, 15012, the info, it talks about when you can log approaches and when you can't. Um, so it's it's pretty interesting to to see. I'll, I'll ask everybody, all right, you're going to go out and do an approach, and it's in IMC conditions, and you do the approach, and you, and you break out at um, 1,000 feet. Can you still log that approach towards your currency? Uh, and the correct answer is it depends. And of course, I did that on purpose. Um, but the reason it depends is it depends on if 1,000 feet above the ground or 1,000 feet MSL, doesn't really matter. Uh, it, that depends on if that's inside the final approach fix or if it's part of the final approach course. So if you make your transition, and this is what the uh, the info for operators 15012 says, uh, when you make your transition from IMC conditions to VMC conditions, uh, if that happens after the final approach fix or on the final approach course of the approach, then you can log the entire approach toward your currency. So you can put that in your logbook as one of your 66 hits uh, approaches. If you break out prior to the final approach course, then you're not going to be able to log that towards your currency. So even though you hit the initial fix and maybe you did one of the T fixes, but you broke out well before the final approach fix, you can't log that approach. Uh, all right, so that is area of operation one task a so we're going to move on to task b where are we at on time here uh 28 oh man uh this is going to be a longer one sorry guys so for the weather information this is task b is weather information man weather is a really complicated thing um to talk about we we talk about it uh at length in the private pilot check ride and, and in the private pilot check ride Talking about weather is more about how can I avoid um, flying in the weather or what kind of weather can't I fly in. But as an instrument pilot, you need to know weather a little bit better, a lot better than a private pilot because now you're actually flying in the weather, right? You're flying in instrument meteorological conditions. And so you need to be able to analyze and tell me, okay, this type of weather system, that would be safe or appropriate for me to try to fly through versus this type of weather system I need to avoid totally. Um, so what I've done here, this is, you can see the knowledge is pretty lengthy here. The risk management is, is longer as well, especially as in task A. And then in the skills, we actually have four skills. So let me read through those and that'll help us determine how this, uh, this discussion is going to go here. So skill one is use available aviation re weather resources to obtain an adequate weather briefing. All right. So great. I need, uh, I need a way to, to get a weather briefing. Got it. And then skill two is analyze the implications of at least three of the conditions listed through K3A through K3L above using actual weather or weather conditions in a scenario provided by the evaluator. All right. So I have to, it's kind of a circular reference. I go back to the knowledge areas and I have to pick three of those knowledge areas and use those to ask a question to cover skill two. Uh, all right, skill three, correlate weather information to make a competent go-no-go -go decision. So I take all of that weather information, that analysis that I've done for my route of flight, and then I decide, is it safe for me to go or is it not safe for me to go? Uh, and then determine whether an alternate airport is required and, if required, whether the selected alternate airport meets regulatory requirements. Uh, and so hopefully I've picked a scenario, and, it, and sometimes it works out, sometimes it doesn't, where you do have to have an alternate. Uh, if I pick a scenario and the day, you know, the weather like today here, it was great. So if we'd have flown to Destin, you wouldn't have needed an alternate. So in that case, I would have to alter the scenario just a little bit and say, okay, well, good job analyzing the weather. Instead of the weather you saw in the actual conditions today, here's what you see. We, you have to file an alternate now. And of course, it's going to be lower minimums. So yeah, you're probably going to have to file an alternate. But we're definitely going to have that discussion on if you need to file an alternate or not. Uh, now, I've, I've put here in my notes a pilot's guide uh, to pre-flight. So pilot's guide to pre-flight briefing. This is a relatively new advisory circular. Uh, we're in December of 2021. This came out in uh, March of 2021. And it's advisory circular 91-92. Uh, what the FAA did here is they kind of responded to the, the public's request for Hey, I've got all these new electronic flight bag 
options like ForeFlight, uh, like Garmin Pilot. Uh, I've got these websites like 1-800 Weather Brief. Um, are those kosher? Is that okay for me to use those resources and get an official uh, weather briefing? Is that okay? All right, so this advisory circular um, helps you as a pilot um, determine on if the information you're getting from your the source that you choose to brief yourself and get a weather briefing uh, meets the regulatory requirements. Uh, and I'm going to kind of skip to one of the last pages of this advisory circular. Went a little too far there. So if you're with me on the on the YouTube channel, you'll see this on the screen now. It actually has at the very end uh, a sample pre-flight checklist. Uh, and I actually like the way that this is this is uh, pulled out. I might I might even add it to my scenarios uh, for my applicants doing their instrument check ride and send it to them and say, hey, fill this out before our check ride. Uh, because contrary to popular belief, um, me as a DPE, I want you to be successful when you come to me and take a check ride. That's one of the reasons why I'm doing these videos. So I hope that everybody that is going to take a check ride with me watches these videos. And this is kind of a behind the scenes look at here's what I'm expecting you. Here's what I would like you to have prepared when you show up and take your check ride. Uh, but if an applicant shows up and they've got this checklist pulled out and they know that the 9192 advisory circular exists, uh, hopefully they've read through it and they definitely have a better idea of what they need to cover on their, their weather briefing and if they've checked all the appropriate boxes. Uh, so go into aviationweather.gov, you know, I'll get that answer a lot. Well, I'm going to go to the AWC website and I'm going to look at this chart and this chart and this chart. And, and they just kind of say, hey, here's what I'm going to do. Uh, and they might miss some stuff. Whereas if they, if they have this uh, sample pre-flight checklist, they print that out and say, all right, I'm going to use this checklist. And as you can see, I've checked off everything, and I've got the uh, the appropriate charts or weather products saved on my iPad or, or even printed off if that's appropriate. So that is uh, an example of something you could use to, to help you prepare for the weather briefing. Uh, now, in my ACS, I kind of make these custom ACS uh, things. If you're interested in having, I might could arrange something like that. Uh, but I've actually... Um, put down uh, links to all of the uh, weather phenomenon that are listed in the knowledge section, and I've linked that directly to Advisory Circular 00-6, which is a really important advisory circular. The 00-6, the that is like the weather Bible. That is how weather works. It talks about air masses and winds and everything. So each one of these uh, knowledge tasks... Uh, 3A through 3L, the ones that you know that I'm going to have to ask at least three questions on, right? Those are all covered word for word in Advisory Circular 00-6. So I know a lot of flight schools work like this where you might have done your weather knowledge module, you know, like six months ago. And here it is, time for you to do your check ride. And you're like, geez, I'm going to this check ride. I would really like to get brushed up on how weather works. Advisory Circular 006, bravo. That's the best way for you to, to uh, kind of beef up your, your weather knowledge. All right. So uh, that is, or those are the four skills that we're going to talk about. I'll probably do a whole podcast or video or both on weather. Um, it, this would be way too long if I went into weather right now. Uh, but just know that I've, you know, weather, we're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about its implications uh, for IFR flying. We're going to talk about icing. That's one of the things that you'll see numerous times in the ACS is implications of icing, airframe icing, um, uh, on you as an instrument rated pilot. All right. The last one that we're going to cover, this is task C, cross-country flight planning. Um, kind of the same as weather. It's, it's a lot longer. We've got six skills. Uh, we've got seven risk management items, and we have five uh, knowledge areas. Actually, we have more than five. We have uh, three, six, seven, eight knowledge areas. Um, so let's let's start with the skills. Again, start with the skills, and, and that will help you determine um, where your studying is going to go. So prepare, present, explain a cross-country flight plan assigned by the evaluator, including a risk analysis based on real-time weather, which includes calculating time and route, 
and fuel, considering factors such as power settings, operating altitudes, wind, fuel, reserve requirements, and weight and balance requirements. Skill two, recalculate fuel reserves based on a scenario provided by the evaluator. Skill three, create a navigation plan and simulate filing an IFR flight plan. Skill four, interpret departure arrival, en route, and approach procedures with reference to the appropriate current charts. Skill five, recognize simulated wing contamination due to airframe icing and demonstrate knowledge of adverse effects of airframe icing during pre-takeoff, takeoff, cruise, and landing phases of flight, as well as the corrective actions. Skill six, apply pertinent information from the appropriate and current weather uh, <laughs> current aeronautical charts, chart supplements, notums relative to the airport, runway and taxiway closures and other flight publications so those are the skills uh, that you're going to have to demonstrate during this section of the oral and remember you have to demonstrate proficiency in all six of those skills now in demonstrating proficiency in those six skills you're uh it's unavoidable you're going to demonstrate some knowledge activities and risk management activities that are listed on this page as well um so some of the risk management, external pressures, pilot, aircraft, uh, kind of goes through the PAVE acronym, basically, improper fuel planning. Uh, some of the knowledge areas, um, calculating time, climb, and descent rates, uh, estimated times of arrival, effects uh, or elements of an IFR flight plan, and then procedures for activating and closing IFR flight plans in controlled and uncontrolled airspace. Those are examples of knowledge areas. Um, all right, so what am I going to ask for here? So this is the part of the check ride where you get to show me, and this is kind of combined with the weather analysis too, because the weather analysis is going to involve you briefing kind of your cross country, which includes altitudes and all that. Uh, so if you're going to do this on an EFV like ForeFlight, that's great. You can show me on ForeFlight. You can have it printed out. I'd like to see your nav log. Uh, I'd like to see your briefing where you, you did all that. I would like to see, and I'm going to ask to see the performance calculations that you used in ForeFlight because ForeFlight is great. I love it. Uh, if you listen to any of my stuff, I'm a huge ForeFlight proponent, and, and I get excited when applicants come to me on the check ride. They're using ForeFlight, and they know how to use it. I, I really don't like to see applicants that come in, and their instructors have been like, hey, here's ForeFlight you know, a week before the check ride, it's going to be a lot easier than the way we've normally been doing it. So here, go use it on your check ride. And I just kind of shake my head because ForeFlight is, is a great program, but it is a program and, it, and it's not, um, I, w I wouldn't call it easy to use correctly. I mean, they've done their best at making it easy. And I think, uh, relatively speaking, it is easy. Uh, but we're not talking about Facebook or Instagram. Like, this is a application that has direct safety implications on how you're going to fly your airplane. And if you don't know how to use it properly, you could put yourself in a dangerous situation. So when you show up and you haven't really put in uh, the appropriate level of thought into the performance profile for your aircraft, uh, you might dispatch yourself on a flight that you just don't have enough fuel to do. And ForeFlight says you do have enough fuel to do it because you told ForeFlight bad information. Uh, in the military, we call it crap in, crap out, right? I've got this FMS, I've got this computer in the plane that I can program stuff into. And if I program the wrong stuff into it, it's going to give me the wrong answer. So if uh, you don't know how to use ForeFlight properly, that could be a real sticking point during the check ride. Uh, so make sure that you, you're you comfortable and competent on using ForeFlight uh, or any EFB that you bring in. Uh so the, the first skill, that's pretty self-explanatory. You're going to show me how you did your planning, so I'm going to ask to see that. Then I'm going to throw a wrench into the scenario and say, oh, yeah, by the way, we're going to need to divert over to this airport over here. How is that going to uh, impact our fuel planning? Um, create a, a – or, yeah, cre skill S3, create a navigation plan and simulate filing an IFR flight plan. That's one that surprisingly gets missed a lot because – um, I, I don't really know why, uh, I guess on four flight, it's so easy to file and, and maybe we're not filing, uh, so why the flight plan gets overlooked, I, I think is because, um, again, four flight Garmin pilot, they make it incredibly easy for you to file a flight plan through the app. It's not as intuitive on how to get the international flight plan form out of the EFB, right? Because it just does it for you, and rightly so. 
you know, their main selling point is it makes it easier. Uh, but the the ACS is pretty clear that it wants you to simulate filing an I for a flight plan. And so for really for us to do that, um, you can show me, of course, on four flight or Garmin Pilot, hey, here's how I would file electronically. But then I'm going to ask to see kind of the, the, I call them modes and codes. So the modes and codes that go on that international flight plan form, do you have those set up correctly for the aircraft that you're using? Uh, if you don't, then we need to, to figure out what the correct codes are, or you need to show me, here's how I would find out the correct codes for my aircraft. And that can be kind of tricky. I do a whole YouTube video on modes and codes, uh, and I'll probably do one again in the future. It's been, um, I think, over a year since I've done the last one. Um, at any rate, I need to see a flight plan. Um, interpret departure, arrival, en route, and approach procedures uh, using the current charts. So, of course, we're going to talk about instrument flight plans or instrument approaches. Um, we're going to talk about departure procedures, arrival procedures, and we're going to talk about the approach procedures. Uh, the big stuff, you know, most people get that. So the inbound courses, the frequencies, the minimums, all of that. I'm going to, of course, make sure that you can demonstrate proficiency in using those. But then we're also going to talk about some of the stuff that maybe got skipped over or glossed over in your training because again I don't I don't want to I don't want you to make make you feel stupid uh, I don't want to force you to get questions wrong or anything like that I'm not going to ask these esoteric questions that don't have any effect on your flying at all because uh, I could definitely do that if I wanted to but what I want to do is is show you hey even though you have demonstrated enough proficiency to pass the instrument check ride there's a lot of knowledge out there that you need to continue um, continue learning. You need to continue to seek out how to be a better instrument pilot because there's there's so much stuff to be in an instrument pilot. It's not even funny. Uh, so a lot of the notes and stuff, I, I'm going to ask some questions on those. I love to ask about uh, non-standard climb-out gradients. So the trouble T is what I call them, the, the T note up there. Uh, and then more importantly, how to find... Uh, the the obstacle departure procedures on your EFB is one of the things that's kind of uh, kind of a detractor to move into EFBs is before we moved to EFBs we had the big paper pubs and those paper pubs for your region had all had everything in it just in that one document well now in the EFB it's kind of scattered in different locations depending on the EFB that you're using and it can be difficult to find and if you don't know how to find those that's that's a problem you need to be able to at least find this information uh, recognize simulated wing contamination uh, due to airframe icing. So that's something that I'm going to have to work in uh, with this scenario where we'll just say, hey, you're, you're flying along and you're having to add a lot of nose up trim all of a sudden and nothing else has changed. You know, what could be going on? Your IMC, it's eight degrees outside uh, and there's an icing air mat that's a thousand feet above you. You know, okay, it might be icing, right? How am I going to handle that? Do I need what kind of anti-icing uh, or de-icing capabilities does this plane have? How am I going to use those and what am I going to do? Am I going to declare an emergency? All that stuff that, that we're going to talk about there. And then apply a pertinent information in regards to NOTAMs, charts, uh, all that flight publications. Uh, that will kind of happen naturally along with doing the previous uh, five skills. We're going to talk about that last one. But uh, those, are, those are the six skills. And this is the last task that we're going to do that's specifically for the oral. So we're going to go into area of operation two on our next episode. Uh, but I've talked for well over 40 minutes now on just tasks A through C uh, and kind of done, I, I don't know if I'd call this a, a mock oral. I hear that term a lot, but this is kind of, these are the questions that I'll be asking during the check ride. So if you listen to this, it'll definitely help you. No matter what DPE you use to do your check ride, uh, they're going to ask questions that are similar to this. So uh, I really appreciate you guys for listening, taking the time to tune in to the YouTube channel or the podcast. I'd really appreciate it if you subscribe. More importantly, I would appreciate it if you tell your friends about it and say, hey, Seth's putting out some really good content. Uh, it'll help you get ready for your check ride. Uh, go listen to it and uh, let me know how it works out for you. I would love to hear your experience. If, if you've used my 
uh, information and then gone out and had a successful outcome of your check ride. I'd love to hear about that. So send me an email and I'll talk about it in one of the future shows. Um, give me ideas for any content, any questions that you have about this video, uh, send to me. So you can uh, reach out to me at seth at vsl.arrow. Uh, you can go to our website, vsl.arrow. It has information on our flight school. Uh, and you can look us up on Facebook, all those other places. But uh, I will talk to you guys next time. Thanks again. See you.